what do you do when life just seems like it's coming apart? What do you do when all of your hopes and your dreams, all, all the things that maybe you have not only based your life on, but the things that you have worked your entire life for, what do you do when those things simply aren't coming through? Maybe it's in, maybe it's in the form of, of relationships. Maybe relationships are just not what, what you'd expected. Maybe you got a diagnosis that you just rather not have that diagnosis because you're not sure how you're going to get around it. Or maybe in your life you, you just feel all alone. You just feel like you're out there and maybe maybe the job that you wanted, you get the phone call and the guy says, well, you know, we decided we're going to go another direction. We have all had those times in our lives. If you haven't, you will. We've had those things in, in our lives. And the interesting thing that, that has struck me as we've gone through this study is that I think we're in pretty good company. I think there, was a lot of, there were a lot of people in Rome that the Apostle Paul is writing to who were going through those same kinds of things. And we're going to talk about that this morning and, and uh, just, just hopefully get some encouragement from those things. As, uh, this morning we're going to be in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. And so if you want to uh, turn in your Bibles or your Bible app again, if uh, you've got any form of Bible on your phone, the password that we have here is Christian uh, with a small c. Um, and I encourage you to, to use those devices as, as we go through this time together. As we prepare, let's, let's, let's go ahead and go to God and pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. And Father, I understand who I am and I'm grateful that you've chosen to use me. And I'm humbled that you choose to use me, Father, because I, I confess um, the struggle that I have of, of sinfulness in my life. And I'm thankful, and I'm thankful that you, you choose to see beyond uh, who I am to what I can be through your power and strength. I simply ask this morning that you would help me to communicate boldly, clearly, courteously, kindly, and lovingly to my friends this morning. And help us to receive your words and, and your message. Help us to receive the things that you want to say to us with open harm, arms and, and open hearts and allow you to change us in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we're going to do some flying this morning. Uh, the eighth chapter of the book of Romans is one of the greatest chapters, in my opinion, in all of Scripture. It is one of the richest. It is one of the fullest. It is, and, and, and to say, well, we're, we're going to, it, it's kind of like a, um, you know, it seems like everybody I run into, everybody in the world seems to love the, the movie, the Chevy Chase movie, Vacation. And, and when you, you say that, there's almost always people will say, it's kind of like Chevy Chase is in charge of his family, and he's in charge of keeping the schedule, and they get behind on the schedule. And so there's that great scene when they get to the Grand Canyon, and they all pile out of the car, and they go up to the edge of the Grand Canyon, going like this, and then they're all back in the car. Well, that's that's going to be how you feel um, this morning in some ways. As a matter of fact, what I want to do, if, if I can accomplish something, what I'd like to accomplish is to encourage you to go back and read and to reread and to reread uh, the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. Because in here, the Apostle Paul, to these people who are going through the things that I described just a little bit earlier, to them he teaches them about what we have in Jesus Christ. It's not about what we don't have. It is about what we have in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to give you a little disclaimer this morning because the things that I'm talking about are things that we have in Jesus Christ. But if someone is not in Jesus Christ, you don't have these things. They don't exist. These are gifts that God has given to us because we've chosen to put our trust 
in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. What the, what the, the whole chapter is basically teaching about is that in Christ, we have a new life. Now, that, that's not a new theme. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul would say it to the Corinthians like this in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. That, in a lot of ways, is, is the central theme of this particular chapter. Because let's come back and look at this passage in Romans chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, because I think right here, this is the heart of everything. Everything that we're going to talk about this morning springs out of these two, two verses. When Paul says, but in Christ, but if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit. Who lives in you. Now all the application that we're going to go, go through this morning springs out of the... And I gave you that Corinthians passage because I, I honestly believe that he's saying the same thing. He was just a little bit more direct and to the point uh, when he talked to the Corinthians. If, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. He has a new life. And that's what Paul is talking about here to the Roman Christians um, a, as well. Now Jesus... Jesus experienced a physical resurrection. Uh, he came back from the dead and he was physically raised. And we will, if we, if we die before Jesus comes back, uh, we will die and we too will experience a physical uh, resurrection. It's only those who have the misfortune of uh, being alive when Christ comes back. They don't, they don't get to do this physical resurrection thing. It's all just going to be a transformation uh, for them. But <laughs> the thing is that even if, even as that is true in Christ, and maybe more importantly, even more importantly for what we're talking about today, we all experience a spiritual resurrection. And we can do that on a daily basis. Now, I'm sure that you recall our discussion last week, um, those of you who are here, where we, we talked about the struggle that we have with sin in the seventh chapter of, of Romans. And we, we, we struggle with that sin. And if sin has its way, the ultimate result of sin having its way is death. And throughout most of that seventh chapter, it looks like sin's winning. And it looks like sin is going to win. And, and sometimes, sometimes in our lives, we tend to feel that way too. We tend to think, you know, I'm trying to get rid of all this thing. All the sin, but I'm struggling with it, and it looks like I'm never going to win. And so that struggle is real. And then Paul ends that part of his discourse by saying, Who will rescue me from this body of sin and death? And the answer, the answer is Jesus. Jesus rescues us. Jesus saves us. And Jesus removes sin to where it can no longer have a hold on us. Of course, of course, we are going to struggle. In our mortal bodies, we are going to struggle against sin as long as we are alive because of the, uh, the war that's going on inside of us. And so there is always going to be a struggle. But the truth is, we don't have to fear sin's absolute power, which is death. We don't have to fear that because Jesus has rescued us. And Jesus gives us new hope, and he gives us a new life. And um, as a matter of fact, this morning, what I'd like to do for the rest of my time here is focus on three benefits uh, that we have as Christians. And uh, because we have this new life in us, there are, are three benefits that we have gained. The first is this, is that I can struggle without shame. Now, I really want you to get this one. I can struggle without shame. Look what the first two verses here, chapter 8, say. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. When we come to Christ, when we are in Christ, 
when we are living that new life in Christ, everything, everything changes. We're adopted by him. We are chosen by him. And this is what motivates us. It's the fact that he, he has taken care of these things for us. It, it motivates us not to live the way that we, we just say, well, I'm going to live any way that I want to live. That's not what it mo motivates. It, it motivates us to say, you know what? He rescued me. I mean, I, I love the way that, that Sam talked this morning a little bit earlier. I love the way that he talked about, do we understand the depth of our lostness without Jesus Christ? And now I want to say, let's take it the next step. Do we also understand the depth of our savedness? I know that's not a word, so go ahead and shoot me. But do we understand how important that is because of the life in Christ? Do we understand how much he has given us life? And so my life is motivated. <coughs> it's not motivated by saying, well, you know what, man, he, he, he did all these things so I can do whatever I want and I'm going to be okay. I want to live my life in gratitude to him. Because he has done so much. He gave his life for me. Is that, that can only motivate me to want to please him with every day of my life. Now let me say this. We are going to struggle with sin, but understand that struggling with sin is very different from justifying sin or denying sin or seeking out sin. Struggling with sin means I, I, I understand that God has the standard. God. God's law, is, as we looked at last week, God's law is good, it's pure, it's holy. But I'm not. And so I recognize that struggle that I have. And so I die to my flesh. And I live to the Spirit, live in the Spirit. And the result is that I get rid of the guilt and I can struggle. The struggle that I have, I can go through that without, there is no shame. There is no shame in the struggle. Now that's what the church has been called to be, friends. A place where the struggle can be real without shame. We are called to be a group of people who understand our humanity. And in understanding our humanity, we do not try to hide it. We do not try to cover up the places where we are struggling. But we get mutual strength and support without shame for those things. A couple of weeks ago, I, I, I had a call from a friend. And, and uh, I, I met this friend for uh, a breakfast. And... Um, don't go looking around the room trying to figure out who it was because it's nobody in, nobody in our, our church. But he said, Lane, I, I want to share something with you. He said, uh, I go to work, and every day that I go to work, I, I have this really beautiful co-worker who keeps hitting on me. And he says, I, I, I've, told my, I've told my wife about it. He says, I haven't done anything about it, but... He says, the temptation's there. I said, I, I understand that. And he said, I, I just want you to know that because I want you to help keep me accountable at that point. I said, I appreciate that. I said, that, that takes a lot of courage for, for you to say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm struggling at this point. Because you know what I know? Every guy that I know would struggle with that. And if you're thinking, if you're sitting there thinking to yourself, no, not me, you're lying. And if you want to say, no, I'm not lying, I'm saying, I don't believe you. And the problem is, is that most people try to handle their struggle with sin the temptations that they find themselves in, most people try to handle those by hiding them. And that's when they get in trouble. 
You see, this, you need to allow the Spirit to shine its light on the struggle. Because when the Spirit shines its light on the struggle, the struggle gets lessened. When you bring something out into the open, then things, then things change. A guy by the name of uh, Richard Heffler uh, wrote this book, Will Daylight, Will Daylight Come is the name of the book. I have never read the entire book, and so I'm not going to flash it up here and recommend it because um, I just, I'm afraid to do that when I, when I haven't read a book. But I did pull a story uh, out of that. He, he tells a story about a boy and a girl who went to visit their grandparents. And uh, on the first day of their visit, Grandpa comes and, and he hands the little boy and he hands him a slingshot. And he says, I want you to be very, very careful with this slingshot, but go out and have fun around the farm. And, and, and the little boy, man, he is trying everything and, and he's into about day three with the slingshot. And he just not, he's not getting very good at it. Picking up rocks and, and he aims at things and, and uh, he misses. And, uh, and he, he keeps doing that, and he keeps, he, he, he keeps missing everything he shoots at. Well, he's on his way back to the farm house. And as he's crossing the, the, the yard to get to the house, there's Grandma's pet duck. You know where this is going. He pulls his slingshot back, thinking, ah, oh, yeah, man, hit anything. Pew! Clocks the duck right in the head. The duck falls over dead. He panics. So what's he do? What does a good little boy do with it? He hides it in the woodpile. Right? So he hides it in the woodpile. And as he is turning to, to go back into the house, he sees his little sister standing at the door. She's seen her open. Well, later that afternoon, Grandma says, Sally, I, I need you to help, help me clean the house. And Sally says, well, you know what, Grandma, we've got this all worked out. My, my brother wants to help you clean. <laughs> and she walks, as she walks by her brother, she says, whack. <laughs> so he cleans the house. A little bit later, Grandpa says, let's, let's, come on, let, let's, let's go fishing. Grab your slingshot, let's, let's go fishing. Well, sister says, well, well, first Grandma says, no, I, I need, I need, uh, I need at least uh, Sally. I need her to stay and help me prepare dinner. Sally says, no, Grandma, we've got it all worked out. My brother, he'll stay, stay and he'll, he'll, help, he'll help fix dinner. Right? Whack. And so the little boy stays home and he helps fix dinner and his sister goes fishing with Grandpa and they come home. Now this goes on for about three or four more days. And at the end of three or four more days, it's getting close to the end of their time with staying at their grandparents. And, and this has just got this little boy torn up into... He, he's torn up in knots. And finally, he can't stand it anymore. And so he, he, he says, I, I got to spell. So he goes to his grandma and he says, Grandma, I, I want you to know how sorry I am, but um, I, I, I killed your duck with my slingshot. She said, I know. She said, I was, I was watching through the window and I, I saw it all happen. And then she pulled him close to her and she hugged him and says, but you know what? I decided a long time ago that I love you and I forgive you. I just wanted to see how long you were going to let your sister make a slave out of you. <laughs> okay, now that's more, that's more true than funny. Because that's what sin does. Is it makes... It makes a slave out of us. And I got to think with the sins that I have and the sins that you have, if Jesus were here in a physical form today 
and he saw the struggle that we're having with the sins that we have in our life, I'm thinking he's going to say, haven't I, haven't I done enough? Didn't I, I? I died for those sins. I did enough. And if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, and if you have repented of your sins, then do not let Satan make a slave out of you any longer. That's what Paul's saying. Chapter 8, verse 33 says, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? And that Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding. He's also interceding for us. Jesus is the only one who could condemn us. He is the only one who could condemn us. And this is saying that he not only forgives us, but he intercedes for us. That is amazing. He didn't just wipe the sin away. He doesn't just say, okay, I'll forgive you that, and I'll try to do a little bit better next time. He intercedes for us to help us. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Do you get it? There is no condemnation. Second thing, second benefit that I have of this new life is I can suffer with a purpose. Verses 18 and 19 in this passage. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. See, awaits, we have something to look forward to. We do. There are going to be a lot of things thrown at us in life, but Satan... <clears throat> Satan has been disarmed and he cannot control the outcome. He can't. The outcome is death and he can't control that. He just can't. Now my life and your life is filled with challenges. And sometimes we, we kind of get pulled up and, and mixed up in the wash. This is my favorite story that I ever read from any of Max Lucado's work. I don't know where he got it. it reads like this. Chippy the parakeet never saw it coming. One second he was peacefully perched in his cage. The next he was washed up, sucked in, and blown over. The problems began when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage. The phone rang and she turned to pick it up. And she had barely said hello when whoop, Chippy got sucked in. The bird owner, owner gasped, put down the phone, turned off the vacuum and opened the bag. There was Chippy, still alive, but stunned. Since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him and raced to the bathroom, turning on the faucet, and held Chippy under the running water. Then, realizing that Chippy was soaked and shivering, she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She reached for the hairdryer and blasted the pet with hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. A few days after the trauma, the reporter who'd initially written about the event, must have been a really slow news day. <laughs> I'm thinking, man, holy cow. Um, the reporter who, who, uh, who'd initially written about the event contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. Well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. It's not hard to see why. 
sucked in, blown over, washed up. And he just doesn't sing much anymore. And maybe that's you. Maybe it's been a tough year for you. Maybe it's been a tough month or even a tough week. We all have challenges and struggles, but the truth is, is that God can use those struggles and those challenges to deepen us. He can use those challenges to deepen us to the point where we can be an example of how we go through things and lead people to Jesus. You see, Christ knows the adversity. He knows the challenges. He knows the temptations that we face. He just never gave in to temptation. And at Calvary, God stripped Satan of his greatest power, the power of death. Yeah, we're still going to die. I get that. But at death in Jesus is different. It is simply a gateway to paradise. <coughs> John Calvin said this. There's no fragment, fragment of particle in the world which in the grip of the knowledge of its present misery does not hope for resurrection. Yeah. So here we come. Romans 8, 28. If you have your Bibles and a pen, you put a mark by that or circle it. If you've got a Bible app, you put that into your favorites because here's what he says. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Been called according to all things. Doesn't say that God has to pick and choose which things he'll use to our good. Doesn't say that God causes any of these things. Doesn't say that at all. Says that God uses everything. Everything. Essentially for his glory and for our benefit. Now some people like to say, well doesn't the Bible teach that God won't give you more than you can handle? Oh no, it doesn't teach that as a matter of fact. What it teaches is this, which is far superior. That whatever it is, it's not about me enduring it. It's about God using it for my benefit and for his glory. And that is amazing. That is amazing. Now, how do I know that this is true? Okay, Paul elaborates, elaborates on that with the next two verses when he says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also... Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who like to take this term predestination and rip it out of the context of this passage. And what this passage is saying is that God knows everything. See, the concept of predestination, never be afraid of that word. The concept of predestination is never separated from the foreknowledge of God. Because to God, it doesn't happen in, in a linear fashion. It all happens at once. And so God has and said, what, the better way to say this real simply is, this is the way it works. That everything that happens to you in life, God will use for your benefit and for his glory because he set it up that way a long time ago. And he's going to take care of you. And that's the way he designed it. One more thing. I'm never separated from his love. Never. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, verse 35 there, or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger, sword, and I'll move down to verse 37. Uh-uh. No, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, this is a call to holiness. 
This is the ultimate example of love, a sinless God loving a sinful people. And see, so I live it out in my life. And I stay away from sin. Not so much that it's offensive to God, but it breaks God's heart. Do we understand that? That when people choose to go outside of God's design and God's will, it breaks his heart. <coughs> Doesn't just inconvenience us. And God says in Christ, there's nothing that will ever separate you from my love. Nothing. See, what separation does is it creates tension and fear and anxiety. And Satan wants to use all of those tools to bring you down. But God says, nothing will separate you. And in Christ, all of those things that might separate, all those are off the table. And that's where our hope comes from. And the saddest thing is that there's a day coming. There's a day coming when those who wanted nothing to do with God will have it their way. It won't be in this life. It'll be in the next. And they will find themselves in hell, separated from God, all by themselves. Our sin creates a barrier, but he gives us Christ. And Christ builds a bridge. This is the other part of that passage. Sam talked about 51.35 as a parallel passage to that in the life of David. When David said, then I'll acknowledge my sin. And when I acknowledged it and didn't cover it up, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me of my guilt. And said, look at the order. Gave, you forgave me of my guilt and my sin. Sam Houston writes, or Sam Houston was the first governor of, of the Texas area, as, as I understand it. And as you read about his life, he is, he is a pretty tough character. It's a pretty rotten character for a lot of his life. Later on in, in Sam Houston's life, uh, he gave his life to Jesus. And he was baptized in the Rio Grande. And as he was baptized, when the pastor brought him back up from being baptized, he says, Sam, your sins are washed away. And Sam Houston says, man, do I pity the fish in this river. <laughs> and it was solved. Now, Satan wants you to question where you'll spend eternity, but God wants you to solve it. And so he gives you Jesus. A new life in Christ means that you will fulfill your, your mission regardless of the route it takes you. And God's love is, is there through it all. I'm going to show you a video. It's from three years ago, almost to the day, three years ago. Amzie Smith is a 16-year-old girl, just a few months short of her 17th birthday. And... Uh, I, I want you to watch this, and then, then I'll fill you in on the rest of the story. Last November, uh, right, like, it was like November 1st, right after Halloween, um, I started to have this, like, really intense pain in my abdomen, and um, they weren't really sure what it was, and so um, I went to a couple doctors, and it just kept getting worse over, like, the, this three-day span, and so I spent a week and a half in the hospital, um, did a bunch of tests and biopsies, and um, that's when they found out the type. It's uh, stage four adult liver cancer, which is um, really rare in adults, but almost unheard of in kids. The best option at first was chemo, so I did um, two rounds of chemo in December and January. 
for the longest time, my hair is what I thought made me pretty. I was, I loved my hair and everybody else loved it too. And then one day I got out of the shower and I brushed my hair the wrong way and this huge clump fell out and I just broke down in the shower or in the bathroom. I was like, mom. And so um, my mom came in and I went in there and she like buzz cut and it was like the hardest thing ever. And I felt like just so exposed and hideous, but um, I learned really fast that my hair is not what makes me pretty. When I, when I was first diagnosed and they told me that I might, you know, only have a year tops, it was like, oh my gosh, like, I'm so not ready. Like, if God were to come back today, like, would I go to heaven, you know? It was really just a simple decision to start reading my Bible and, um, like really making a conscious effort to um, dedicate time towards it. So like before bed, my mom would read a passage to me or um, if there was a day I was feeling particularly desperate and sad, I would, you know, close my eyes and pray to God and, you know, um, ask him, you know, what do you want me to learn? What do you want me to do in the next week? Um, and I pray and I'd open the Bible and I'd just, you know, take that. And the more I did that, the closer to God I started to feel. And um, when I finally realized that like, this was his purpose for me, you know, was to use this, however, um, to to spread his love to more people. Because, I mean, that's the ultimate goal as a Christian is to um, spread the faith and go make disciples. And um, God just gave me a really special way to be able to do that. He gave me a special tool um, with this cancer to be able to um, reach more people. Everybody's looking for happiness. I think that's what everybody's looking for. And the only true way to find happiness is like, you know, all the time is through the joy that God gives you, like in knowing that you're saved. He's like everything to me now. Like he's my number one support system. And um, honestly, he's the love of my life. And I get to say that because um, a lot of people have their whole lives to find all these things that they're gonna fall in love with and the people that they're gonna fall in love with. But for me, this like short time looming over my head, you know, I may not get to grow up and, um, you know, find a husband or, you know, uh, the love of my life. But God loves me more than anyone ever can, ever. Just everything. If you think about how much like the people in your life love you, like your mom and your friends, God loves you like a thousand times more than all of that, and no one can even touch that. And so, knowing that you know someone like that has my back and that I can be uh, so close with that, that is really special to me. Last month, I went into the hospital because I was having a new pain, and. Um, they did a CT scan and it turns out that some of the tumors that they thought were dying are actually growing. And so um, at this point we're thinking like weeks, maybe turning into months. But um, my goal is to make it to my 17th birthday, which is October 15th, so. 16 years old and she gets it. I think one of my favorite parts is when she said, God gave me this special tool, cancer. We turn on the television and the rest of the story would be she had this miraculous cure of cancer. In January of the following year, she ran to the love of her life. And her testimony is still here three years later. You think you got problems? In an earthly sense? The other part of that, she said, he is the love of my life. What can separate us? In Christ, nothing. Nothing. Father, I thank you. I thank you for how much you care about us. 
how you reach into our life and change us. And all you want is for us to come to you. Father, I, I just ask it today that you'd grab Amzi and tell her we say thanks. Because her testimony is still alive. And help us to take it seriously to come to you. In the name of Jesus.